Thirst for justice. 
actually it's a curriculum that was a study guide for congregations and students. We're going to do a portion of it. I'll post the rest of it on Facebook um, either today or tomorrow, and you can get the rest of it there if you're interested in learning more about the topics that we aren't going to cover. We're going to look specifically at minimum wage um, and unemployment. The other topics that are included in the study guide are wage theft and paid sick time. So it's all those kind of things that we talk about um, in Moral Monday. So what we're going to do during this time is share some statistics with you about related to each of the issues. Um, we're going to hear a story, kind of one of those sharing our stories, even though it's not personal stories from Journey, it's stories of people who have experienced these things. We're going to um, delve into the Bible and see what the Bible has to say, and then do a little reflection. So we'll kind of be going through that motion for several different topics. But first, kind of as an introduction, I want to have you watch with me um, a little video clip called Common Sense Economics that will kind of set the stage for some of the issues that we're going to address. I don't have health insurance because it was too expensive. I'm living with a friend, and I can't afford to pay her rent. I can't even afford to pay half of it. When I got out of the service, it was, it was tough to find a job. Working for a non-union glass shop is terrible. You're always being pushed to get work done, unsafe conditions. The pay was horrible. Benefits were almost non-existent. Tengo 18 años de trabajar en la industria de, de salvacheros. No teníamos ningún beneficio, no nos daban una noche, no comíamos nada. Había que veces sin tomar un café en todo el día. They give you a little bit of nothing and have you work like a slave. It's very important to have good middle class jobs. Without middle class jobs, it would be just rich and poor. across the country today. This is turning into the city of the very rich and the very poor. We can't let that happen. We need to have a middle class here. In North Carolina, protesters are descending weekly on the state legislature. The protests are called Moral Mondays. This is not their house. This is our house. Right now, dreamers are rallying again outside ICE headquarters in downtown Phoenix. They want deportation to stop. This is a very large protest here, Joe. Similar protests were held in 100 cities across the nation. Walmart can afford to pay us enough to live there. Car wash workers are coming forward to protest their working conditions. A nationwide push workers calling for a much higher minimum wage. Workers at McDonald's, Wendy's, Domino's Pizza, and more will walk off the job today. We're here to support not only ourselves, but our community. I couldn't believe really I had all this time. People that was behind us trying to help us to make life better for us at Walmart. Starting January 1st, 13 states raised the minimum wage. A city south of Seattle has passed the highest minimum wage in the U.S. Car washes announced that they would unionize marking the latest victory for immigrant worker rights. A few hundred thousand federal workers will receive raises. The developers reached a deal with the Building Construction Trades Council to build the entire project using unionized labor. You can't push people but so hard. You can't push people down but so much. And after a while, they have to stand up. When we come together and fight together, we can improve our lives. Yo quiero un futuro mejor para mis hijos, que tenga con su corazón y diga, sí, que se puede.
just going to share with you some statistics. First of all, um, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, Bureau of Labor Statistics, the national unemployment rate sits at about 5%. It's record low right now. This means that about 8 million people are without jobs. However, here's the big however, the 5% does not take into consideration those who have stopped looking for work or those who are for forced to work part-time part -time jobs because there aren't any full-time positions available. The real number for both the unemployment and underemployed in the U.S. is much higher. Some estimate that as high as 25%. In other words, one in four Americans are either unemployed or grossly underemployed. So first we're going to hear a story from Dan and then a scripture reading from Amy. I have been an electrician for over 17 years. I raised my daughter on my earnings instead of welfare. I have not worked in over three years. It's horrible being unemployed. I bought a place two and a half years ago, my own place for the first time ever. In November of this year, I lost my place and everything I had. I had to sell my furniture to pay the bills. I moved in with my mom who, had, who has paid my bills for two months. She can't afford it anymore. She's on Social Security. I can't even get an $8 job. I'm overqualified. I just want a job, yes. I'm used to making good money, but I went on unemployment and used that all up. I have no income coming in. I will take any job. It's better than $0 an hour. At times, I don't care if I live or die. It doesn't matter to me. The only thing that keeps me going is my daughter, and my very special granddaughter, and my animals. I would be living on the streets if it wasn't for my mom. From John chapter 5, verses 1 to 17. After this, there was a Jewish festival, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate in the North City Wall, is a pool with the Aramaic name Bethesda. It had five covered porches, and a crowd of people who were sick, blind, lame, and paralyzed sat there. A certain man was there who had been sick for nearly 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, knowing that he had already been there a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? The sick man answered him, sir, I don't have anyone who can put me in the water when it is stirred up. When I'm trying to get to it, someone else has gotten in ahead of me. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. Immediately the man was well and he picked up his mat and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. The Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath, you aren't allowed to carry your mat. He answered, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. They inquired, who is this man who said to you, pick it up and walk? The man who had been cured did not know who it was because Jesus had slipped away from the crowd gathered there. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said, see, you have, made, you have been made well. Don't sin anymore in case something worse happens to you. The man went and proclaimed to the Jewish leaders that Jesus was the man who had made him well. As a result, the Jewish leaders were harassing Jesus since he had done these things on the Sabbath. Jesus replied, my father is still working and I am working too. John 5 is a microcosm of the world that we live in. There are all these sick people lying around trying to jump into the pool of Bethsaida because they believed that the water was stirred by an angel. And when that happened, sick people could jump in and get well. Bethsaida means house of grace. All the sick and broken people are waiting to receive grace at this place, but instead, they find the rat race well in progress at the pool of Bethsaida. Indeed, this is our world. Those who are capable can jump right in and seemingly receive more grace, money, happiness, blessings. Those who are slow or without the right connections may wait around forever. Remember the Occupy Wall Street movement? 
It's an outcry against such, such oppressive structures of our society where rich get richer and poor get poorer. It's a movement that sprang out of a desperate desire for a new system, new ideology where people don't have to run the rat race anymore, but live as valuable human beings with dignity and confidence as they experience the healing touch of true grace. One of such people waiting by this magical pool was a man who had been an invalid for the last 38 years. Over the years, he might have grown disillusioned and complacent. But interestingly, Jesus sought him out and healed him. This healing doesn't only involve the physical aspect. Jesus healed him and let him carry his own mat. Jesus validated him and restored his dignity by putting him to work. Consider what it means for us as Christians to be called to restore people's dignity and validate their worth in the face of joblessness. People are searching for a different paradigm than the rat race they have been running for so long. As people of faith, we need to contribute in putting them to work. All of us have received God's grace and we refuse to live in a society where we are forced to run the rat race. Anyone who is able and willing should be able to carry their own mat with dignity and with confidence. So I invite you to a time of meditation reflecting on these questions. Are you or anyone you know unemployed? How do you or they deal with the crisis? Why do you think unemployment or underemployment happens today? As Christians, how should we approach the issue? And can a faith community work together to give jobs back to people? University Valley, 
for Living Wages in 2005, a middle-aged African-American woman rose to introduce herself and speak to the crowd. Standing there in her uniform, she stated her name and job title, a custodian, then paused before saying slowly and deliberately, everyone keeps telling me not to speak today. They say I'll lose my job or not get my raises, but I'm telling you today that I'm not afraid. There's nothing they can do to me with God on my side. In front of a hundred students, faculty, and other staff, she relayed her story of working two jobs, one of them full-time, to feed her daughter and take care of an aging mother. She expressed her frustration in not having enough time with her family, with her seemingly ceaseless work. With strength and clarity in her voice, she ended by stating her hope for a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. This reading is from Matthew 20. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After he agreed to, with the workers to pay them a denarian, he sent them into his vineyard. Then he went out around nine in the morning and saw others standing around in the marketplace doing nothing. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I'll pay you whatever is right. And they went, and they went. Again, around noon, and then at three in the afternoon, he did the same thing. Around five in the afternoon, he went and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you just standing around here doing nothing all day long? Because no one has hired us, they replied. He responded, You also go into the vineyard. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the, call the workers and give them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and moving on finally to the first. When those who were hired at five in the afternoon came, they each received one denarian. Now when those who hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarian. When they received it, they grumbled against the landowner. Those who were, who were hired last worked one hour, and they received the same pay as we did, even though we worked the whole day in the hot sun. But he replied to them, to one of them, Friend, I did you no wrong. Didn't I agree to pay you one denarian? Take what belongs to you and go. I want to give this one who has was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with what belongs to me? Or are you resentful because I'm generous? Those, so those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. So in this story, the workers who are called to work in the vineyards were all day laborers. This kind of work is pretty much common back in biblical times. You may have even, if you've ever gone to some urban, urban environment, seen it play out in big cities across our nation. People who are gathered waiting to be picked up by people who might need help for an odd job such as moving or some sort of labor requiring manpower. Well, the picture of people waiting out in the marketplace to work in the vineyard is similar to that. You can imagine what the people must have felt as others were picked, but they were not. It meant going home empty-handed. It meant going home to hungry children and a hungry spouse. Finally, finally, at the very last hour of the workday, they are picked to go and work in the vineyard. They would have been grateful just to receive the very minimum for their work because after all, they only work for an hour. However, they all end up receiving the same amount as the ones who came to work early at different hours of the day. They all receive a living wage, a wage they can take home and have enough to feed their children, a wage they can take home and have enough to buy clothes and to pay the rent. 
enough to live on, enough to dream on, enough to labor for, enough to provide for them and their families. Jesus believed not in a minimum wage, but in a living wage. Indeed, in God's kingdom, there is no minimum wage, only abundance. As we strive to live out God's kingdom and kingdom values, let us restore people's dignity and pay them enough for their labor so they can lead lives of decency and abundance. So I invite you to a time of reflection, and as you reflect, maybe reflect on these questions. Have you thought about what a fair day's wage for a fair day's work might be? Have you heard the scripture reading and what feelings come to mind when you hear the reading? What group do you most resonate with? And as Christians, how can we advocate for a living wage in our own state? Harrison the millionaire and his friends. 
We, as people of faith who live in the real world Swiss town and constantly encounter people who are injured by falling rocks, must do both. Be involved in the rescue and relief efforts and go confront Harrison the millionaire and his friends. First, let's discuss what it means to take personal responsibility on behalf of all of those affected by the raining rocks. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. This is the kind of fast day I'm after. To break the chains of injustice and to get rid of exploitation in the workplace, to free the oppressed and to cancel debts. What I'm interested in seeing you do, sharing your food with the hungry, inviting homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on the shivering ill-clad, being available to your own families, do this, and the lights will turn on, and your lives will turn around at once. Your righteousness will pave your way. The God of glory will secure your passage. And then when you pray, God will answer. You'll call out for help, and I'll say, here I am. If you get rid of unfair practices, quit blaming victims, quit gossiping about other people's sins, if you are generous with the hungry and start giving yourselves to the down and out, your lives will begin to glow in the darkness. Your shadowed lives will be bathed in sunlight. I will always show you where to go. I'll give you a full life in the emptiness of places, firm muscles and strong bones. You will be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build a new, rebuild the foundations from out of your past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything. Restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate. Make the community livable again. So I invite you to a time of prayer as we respond to what we have heard and what we have heard God say. Uh, first of all, I'll be sharing a little bit of a prayer and then there'll be a litany for us to join in. So please join me in the spirit of prayer. Spirit of love and life, on this Labor Day weekend, we ask your special blessing on all people who labor, either to provide a living for themselves and their families or as volunteers enhancing the life of their community. And today we honor and acknowledge the work of all people in jobs or in pursuit of education, in the workplace or at home, in the U.S. and around the world. We especially pray for your blessings on workers who labor at low wages. We celebrate their hard work and we mourn the ways that workers' worth and dignity are devalued. We lament that laborers work hard and yet still go hungry. Creator God, help us to build a new world in the midst of the old, a world where all workers are uplifted, a world where those who can clean houses can afford housing, a world where those who grow food can also provide nourishment to their families. Fill us with courage and strength to walk in love in the workplace and in the marketplace, as well as in our place of worship. We dare to pray, God, let the wor world be changed, for we long to see the end of poverty. We dare to pray, God, let the laws be changed, for we long to see all jobs pay a wage that enables a life of dignity and sufficiency. We dare to pray, God, let the wealth distribution be changed. For we long to see an economy that brings justice to the poor. We dare to pray, God, let our life be changed. For we long to bring hope where good news is needed. In the strength of your spirit and inspired by your compassion, we make this promise. To work for change and to wait confidently for the day when you make all things new. Amen. We have opportunity now to share both our joys and our concerns. We are changing up the tables in the middle this time. So if you have a joy or a concern to share, I'm going to ask you to come over and to light a candle. I invite you to pray our prayer of response. 
Holy God, as you have touched us, may you now touch others with your love and us. And so we take the flame and light our care candles for ourselves, for those named or remembered, and in solidarity with those who cannot express their concern or celebration. And gracious God, we lift up all of those named places and people and situations before, before you. We offer them to you because we know that you are a God who not only hears our prayers, but in your mercy you answer our prayers. So Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. Amen. We have opportunity now to respond to God's goodness uh, by giving our offering on a pass around the baskets. Uh, once again, if you're a newcomer worshiping with us for the first time, please be our guest. This is uh, an opportunity for those to give who have made a commitment to our church and to the ministry that we do here. Also, I'm sending around the sign-in sheet for greeters, worship assistants, and refreshment people for the fall. It's a new season, so sign on up, people. Um, and as you do that, you can multitask, and if you want to sing the words of the song, you can. If you just want to listen, you can do that.
We know that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after they had eaten together, Jesus took the cup, and he blessed it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The first time that Jesus sat down to this meal, among those gathered were one who would doubt him, one who would deny him, one who would betray him, and they would all leave him before the night was over. And he knew it. And still he sat down and he ate with them. If he ate with them, surely he is ready to eat with us, baptized or not, confessed or not, Sure or not, sinner or saint or a little bit of both, all you have to do to eat at this table is to be hungry, and God will do the rest. So we're going to play some music, and what I invite you to do, just invite somebody at your table to break the bread and share it. In the cup, it's all grape juice today. It's got too darn complicated to put wine and grape juice on every table, so everything's grape juice. You decide whether you want to dip, drink, I don't care. You decide, but I invite you to share the meal with your family at your table.
empowering us to inspire others to its pursuit, seeking compassion and justice for all God's children. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.